Hi everyone, this is Trang and welcome to a guest edition of Ask Ron with Joel Sangerman. That's Trang, I'm Joel. What's the first question? Our first question is on profit sharing and it's from Fernando Diaz uh, from Connecticut. Hey Fernando. Say the owner wants to sell but doesn't want to lose part of their equity. If we strike a purchase price, can we share a percentage of any and above the purchase price when the investor goes to sell? Well, Fernando, you certainly could do that, but the real question is why? Uh, wouldn't it be a lot easier just to go ahead and agree on a price and, and then get that to the seller when it cashes out? You know, they're not necessarily going to concede any equity on a, on a pretty house deal because we're going to be selling for a premium based on the, the great terms that we're going to create for our buyer. So if you're referring to an ugly house deal though, then uh, back in the day we used to do split funded deals all the time with sellers where we'd go ahead and share the proceeds after retailing it. But, but today I'd rather just go ahead and give them the price that they can live with um, as long as it meets our criteria. Uh, of course, that's gonna be up to you. Now you may be in a situation where the terms that they want aren't good enough for you to close and in those cases, we're usually going to take the deal out to the market, uh, take it out to the market with, with a long escrow, preferably 90 days, and no assurances that we're definitely gonna close. Uh, but when that buyer appears, and the market has basically spoken, then we're gonna go ahead and restructure the deal so that the seller can get a portion of the, the down payment that our buyer brings in. So really on this one, I think the key is just to strike a deal that's gonna work for everyone and to be flexible. And as long as it makes sense and you're not taking unnecessary risk, uh, then you got yourself a deal, Fernando. Okay, our next question is on a lease purchase and it comes from Scott Tayeb of California. Well, hey he, Scott. He actually has a few questions. One, um, when a cashing out of a sandwich lease option, do two closings have to take place? One between me and the seller and the other between me and the tenant buyer? The other question is, would it be possible to have the seller directly deed the property to the new buyer in a sandwich lease? If yes, how would my portion of the equity show up on the closing statement? Okay, Scott. So really you have several options and one way to go about it is with a simultaneous close of your purchase option from the seller and fund that from the proceeds from the buyer that you're selling to. But sometimes being quite candid, that can be a little bit problematic with the lenders. It can be problematic with underwriters and even with some, some title companies. So my personal preference is to go ahead and create a new purchase and sale agreement and then just go ahead and link my seller up directly with my buyer. That way you can go ahead and protect your, well, the, the way to do that is to uh, record your agreement, record it as a memorandum of option on the home that effectively clouds the title and then the title company they're gonna uh, get a release in order to provide title insurance for the the new buyer uh, your attorney is going to need to prepare a lien release and a payoff letter and that'll allow the title company to go ahead and pay you from the proceeds and then also they'll indicate on the actual settlement statement uh, that it was a lien payoff so that's really a, a good strategy it's my preferred strategy actually uh, but here's a couple more points to think about in that situation uh, and maybe a reason to not do that. For one, if you close both options as a simultaneous close, then there's a really good chance that you can get the seller to reduce the option price, especially if you're, if you're early in exercising your, your option. So that actually creates more back-end spread. Uh, I'd always try to do that first, and, and it's one of the reasons that uh, actually I rarely argue about price with the sellers because I know that I can use that, that, that good price that I'm giving them, I can use that as a way to get lower monthly payments, uh, a lower to uh, possibly a, a no down payment situation, and then later when life happens, as it always does over a period of time, uh, particularly to, to some of the sellers that we work with, they almost always will take a huge lump sum with a discount and you end up being both a hero to them and a little bit richer because of taking that approach. So really, 
the world is your oyster and uh, you can choose from several different ways to go ahead and, and, and profit from uh, a sandwich lease. Thanks for the question, Scott. What else you got, Trang? Oh, here's a good question. Well, let's see what you say. It's regarding an ex-wife and buying on contract and it comes from Walter Peterson from Iowa. I bought a house with seller financing. My lawyer drew up the contract and did a title opinion option. Turns out the seller's ex-wife claims he owes her money and won't sign a release, which my lawyer says he needs. <coughs> I already signed the contract. I know her name is not on the deed and there's no judgment against the house. I have another couple who wants to buy it from me with seller financing. The original seller will deed me the house. My lawyer is saying not to in case judgment comes against the original seller. If the house is not in his name, how could they attach if the property is in my business name? Should I have him deed me the property? Also, my lawyer is saying I can't sell a property with seller financing if I bought it with the seller financing. Is she correct? Well, it just so happens that I happen to be an expert in dealing with ex-wives. Even though I've only done it once, I got the kids, I got the house, I even got the dang dog. <laughs> so actually, you know, I think we're recording this, this is gonna go on YouTube. Uh, I should probably say my ex-wife is a real peach. Uh, Trang, you actually uh, love my ex-wife too, don't you? Yeah, she's the best, Joel. <laughs> All right, so the, the real problem here is uh, in, in getting title insurance. Who's this question from again, by the way? Uh, Walter P Peterson. From Walter. Okay, Walter. So anyway, Walter, title insurance is uh, going to be important for the new owner-occupant when they buy it from you. And title is going to have a little bit of an issue insuring if they learn that the seller has an unsettled divorce. Uh, you know, with issues related to the uh, assets or lack of a divorce decree outlining the specifics. So that means when you sell the home, um, you and your buyer won't really have marketable title in the way we like to think about it, or you, you may not. So, you know, you, you might go out and try to buy a release from the wife contingent on realizing the, the proceeds from your new buyer. It might work, but you know, to be candid, who really knows what that kind of emotional stuff involved, but uh, it is probably worth a, a try. Now, this business of your attorney and her telling you that uh, you can't sell on owner financing if you bought on owner financing, I suspect that maybe there's some facts missing from your question or maybe your lawyer uh, misunderstood because l properties are literally sold every day with seller financing that are bought with seller financing. In fact, if, uh, if you're old like, like me and you're as old as dirt like Ron and you lived through the inflation of the, of, of the 70s where new mortgage interest rates, they were like 14%, almost all homes were sold with seller financing. Uh, of course, then came along the due on sale clause, which actually may be what your lawyer is worried about. Uh, and that's just that if a bank decides to call the loan, then you could be tangled up in it. And, you know, unless the lawyer and you do what we recommend, which is get the buyer to sign a CYA letter that's in the gold club, a CYA doc that uh, makes it clear that the bank could call the loan due since the, uh, the deed is transferring. Now that can happen, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty unlikely. Uh, but again, if a disclosure doc is understood and it's signed, it does serve as great protection. And that's why we always use full disclosure docs when we close. Now, uh, if you can work with the wife, go ahead and do it. Uh, get the proper disclosures for resale regarding the due on sale clause. Uh, and of course, if that can't happen, and actually if the spreads are really good monthly, meaning that your payment out to the husband is our ex-husband if, if it's low and you can get a lot coming in from a tenant then i'd probably go ahead and just take title i'm probably not going to uh, buy title on insurance on it uh, but then i'd go ahead and take title and either either rent it or you know possibly even lease option it out which can be a little bit dangerous given the, the marketable title situation but i do it at a very high option price because if if, uh, if the buyer does uh, 
get approved to cash you out, you're going to have a whole lot of room to potentially uh, fix the problem because uh, money fixes a lot of problems. Right, Trang? Yep. What else you got? And we have a final question on selling a mortgage note. It's from Fernando Diaz from Connecticut. I'm doing a wraparound mortgage and keeping seller's existent mortgage. I have checked with the note buyer and they would buy the loan after 12 punctual payments. I purchased the property and created a wrap mortgage. And when I sold, I created another wrap mortgage. When I settled, would I have to settle the first two mortgages? Other than time value of money and the discount rate on the note, what else should I consider when deciding to keep servicing the mortgage or sell the note? This is done in my self-directed IRA, so taxes are not an issue. So Trang, what do you think the answer to that question is? <laughs> I don't know. For Fernando, man, you get the award for the most complicated question of the night uh, for sure. But uh, I could actually use a, a few more facts here, especially with respect to the loan to value ratio. But uh, let me try to replay that. So I'm assuming you, you bought it on a wrap and then you sold it on a bigger wrap and then you're considering actually selling your bigger wrap around note so that you can get uh, cashed out. Uh, I'm presuming there's an underlying bank loan and a note to the original owner that could presumably be paid by your proceeds uh, from selling the note, uh, maybe with some left over. But hopefully you structured the, um, hopefully you structured with no due on sale clause, the first wrap, even though the original bank loan has one. Um, but Hopefully you also have a do on, you do have a do on sale clause on the second wrap from your buyer that uh, you, that you might sell for cash because you'll get you'll you'll get a better deal that way. But the analysis is pretty much that you have to decide if you want payments over time or do you want cash now. Mind you that the cash you get now, based on what I heard here, I don't know the loan to value ratios, but the cash that you get now is probably going to be discounted a ton. So as far as selling the note, that's really up to you, depending on the math, depending on the situation. Uh, but my personal view is that you're still gonna wanna go ahead and make sure that the original seller is being paid because if, if you don't pay it off out of the proceeds uh, from the note buyer, if the original seller doesn't get paid, then he and or the bank have first rights to, to actually get the home back ahead of your note buyer. So either you or the note buyer best be paying the initial wrap to the original set seller. Further, uh, re really in any case, they're personal decisions. Uh, my view on this deal is that there's a whole lot of cooks in the kitchen and that can make the kind of huge mess that I usually try to avoid. But um, I also think you'll probably make more money not discounting the note and just waiting to get your seller qualified for new financing that takes everyone out and gets you mo money, honey. So that's what I would do. Any more questions, Trang? No, nope, that's it, Joel. All right, well, I hope to see everyone in Florida in February for the convention, uh, our family reunion, really. Uh, I can't wait to see Gene Simmons of KISS there. Go ahead and check his interview out with Ron. It is truly phenomenal. Uh, get your registration and your hotel book. There's really no need to wait, so get her done. Sayonara, people. Peace.